great. I really wish I could take credit for taking this photo, but I didn't, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, but this is a uh, mountain goat. This, this picture was actually taken uh, in Montana in Glacier National Park, but you, you, get, you, get the, you get the picture. So for those of you uh, who I haven't had a chance to meet yet, yeah, my name is Steve Wilson and I'm an independent biologist. I work and live mostly in West, I live in Western Canada, I am in British Columbia. I work mostly in Western Canada, but also in other parts of Canada and parts of the Pacific Northwest of the US. I have been presenting on a number of species over the years, uh, uh, mostly caribou, also moose. I, I deal with a lot of our large mammal populations in Western Canada, but I'd never presented on mountain goats. So I thought it was time. And uh, mountain goats are, uh, I'm talking about mountain goats on coastal British Columbia, which is, which is probably the closest to where I live um, to the, uh, in terms of the systems that I've been talking about. I live on uh, the Gulf Islands, which is a small chain of islands between Vancouver Island and the mainland. And so I can look across the Georgia Strait to the mainland coast uh, and, and see actual mountain goat habitat. Um, not from my house, I don't have that good a view, but if I go down to the beach, I can certainly see that area. So um, I've lived and worked here for the last 20 years. This, I'm in my home office here now. And so we, <clears throat> we, my wife and I have been remote workers for 20 years. So this whole COVID thing is nothing new to us because We've basically had this set up for a long time. So, um, but it's been tough for everybody. And like Stefan says, I keep getting the memories on my phone keep popping up and they keep showing, especially at this time of year, because the conference is always at this time of year. So it's always showing me pictures of past conferences and lots of great memories. Okay, so let's talk about mountain goats a bit. So the mountain goat that's here on the left is a species that is native to Western North America, but it's closely related to species in places where many of you live. So in the bottom right-hand corner here, we have the chamois, which of course inhabits the Alps and mountainous areas of Europe. The top right is the Sarau. It's, um, it's native to Japan. There's also the Gora, which is um, native to Russia. And um, the, these goats are descended from, um, they're relatives of the domestic goats. So they're all in the, the same sort of family. And as I said, they're, they're, they, they're found mostly, well, they're found exclusively in Western North America. So these, all these red dots is the current distribution now. And you can see that this is the, the provincial boundary of British Columbia here, the westernmost province in Canada. And so you can see that most of the red is actually occurring within that boundary. So in British Columbia, we have about 60% of the world's mountain goats. So we have a real global responsibility for their for their uh, management. Um, the next largest population would be in Southeast Alaska in the Alaska Panhandle and up actually right along the coast, right up as far as Anchorage. And then also through Canada's mountain parks. So Banff, Jasper uh, in Alberta, there are some mountain goats there. And then more scattered populations in, um, in the Western US. That, pop, that, that area was more continuous in the past. And now you can see there's a bunch of little dots. A lot of those dots are actually transplants where they have been reintroduced to areas where they had been previously extirpated um, right over into South Dakota. So right into the Black Hills of South Dakota, there's actually a small mountain goat population. I don't know if that's, if they were ever native there, if they just decided to introduce them, I don't know. But certainly these populations that are showing up in Colorado, and Utah and Nevada. I have to test my American geography. Don't drudge me, I'm a Canadian. But yeah, that's right. And so there are some scattered populations in there. And I think more than anything, mountain goats are known for living in these extreme environments. So this middle photo here is a, is a photo that I took while doing a reconnaissance flight by a helicopter in Northwestern um, British Columbia. And it would not be unusual to zoom. I don't know if there's any mountain goats on this particular uh, rock face, but it would not be unusual to find them there. Um, I haven't taken a lot of great mountain goat photos, I'm afraid, because I'm usually in a helicopter and you got to pick out the white specks on these, on these hillsides to see if they're there. And of course, there's most of the, it's easy to confuse them with specks of snow, so they can be very difficult to, to find. And um, they also, uh, and you don't want to fly too close to them because you don't want to disturb them. So I do have a short video here 
Uh, just to give you an idea of the way these animals move through their environment. So, so this is actually on a rock face in coastal British Columbia. And most of the summer, the, the nannies, so that's what we call the, the females, the nannies and the kids, young goats are called kids. And they, they get together in these groups of, of adult females, juveniles, and, and young of the year. And you can see them just scrambling along on these cliffs. So this is what we would call escaped habitat. But you can see how treacherous it is. And um, even though these animals are, are species of mountain environments, still the most common way that they die is from falling off cliff faces or in avalanches. Um, and so they're really on these, in these super extreme envir environments. And so you have to ask, well, what are they doing there? Why are they living in these crazy places? And the answer is that they've found a niche. They've found a place where they can live, where they don't have to particularly worry about wolves and grizzly bears who are kind of their primary predators, because obviously they're certainly not going to be climbing out on those rocks. They're not nearly as effective at, at getting around in those, in those kinds of environments. The trade-off, of course, as you can see, there's actually very little to eat there. So um, uh, and we all know the kind of joke about goats is, you know, eat, eating tin cans and that sort of thing. And these animals are really no different. They, they can eat just about anything. Uh, and so often they will spend a lot of time in these rock faces. They might go up into windswept ridges and, and, and basically live on, basically subsist on some, some very marginal um, marginal types of food, uh, but that's the trade-off. They're safe, but at the same time, they don't have a lot to eat. Now, the interesting thing is that um, that is an example, that's kind of the typical habitat where they're up in these rocky areas. But an interesting thing happens when you come over to the coast. And as you may know, uh, coastal, the, the Northwest and uh, British Columbia even more so, and Southeast Alaska, are known for getting a tremendous amount of rainfall. And the reason, of course, is because we have warm Pacific air coming up from the Southwest that's full of moisture. And then it gets pushed up against these mountains. And as the, as the clouds rise, they release their moisture and, and drop that as tremendous amounts of rainfall. So this is a, this is a photo of me on the right. It's a lot, it's, <laughs> it was a while ago now because I still have red hair, but I, uh, this, was, this was about 20 years ago, and friends of mine and I, we, we rented a cabin on a little local ski hill on, on Vancouver Island, and um, it didn't have any electricity or any source of heat other than a wood stove. And so when we got there, the entire cabin was buried in snow. And so I had to, this is, was me digging down just to get to the wood pile. So I could recover the, I, we climbed in through the second floor, the, the loft window to get into the cabin. And so step one was to get down, dig down and get the firewood, which is what I'm doing here. And step two was to dig out the outhouse, which was equally important. My, my wife was on me about that one. But these uh, fairly extreme environments, and for those of you who have been to this part of this neighborhood, maybe you've skied at Whistler, um, but typically coastal ski hills, it's not unusual to have them reporting a base of 500 or 600 centimeters of snow by late winter. So that's five or six meters of snow that we have in the alpine areas of some of these ski resorts. And that's all a result of this, this orographic rainfall that's falling as, as rain towards the coast, which is why where I live, we get very little snow. Uh, it all falls as rain. But of course, as you move up, increasingly, an increasing proportion of that, of that rain falls as snow. <clears throat> and what that does is when you get all that snow up high, the, the, the mountain goats can, never, can no longer live in their preferred environments of staying up high. They actually get forced down to lower elevations where they use uh, the canopies to intercept snow and, and and just get out of that deep snow that's basically covering up all their food and making it very difficult to travel. So this picture on the left, this image is from a, from a colleague of mine in Alaska. His name is Kevin Smith, and he's, he's, uh, he's an excellent mountain goat researcher who works for the Alaska Fish and Game Department. And this was a project where he had put GPS radio collars on mountain goats. And you can see the, the behavior of this one individual. So in the fall, before the snow falls, they're up much like that video that I was showing or the, or, the, um, or the habitat that I was showing you earlier, you can see that the, 
that goat was up here on the southwest facing slope having a good time but as soon as we get into as soon as we start transitioning towards winter and the snowfalls come it's forcing these mountain goats down and there's the orange is that traditional that transitional season as we're moving towards winter and then into the red and they're actually in, in places coming right down to sea level so I don't know the particulars of this project, but this it is labeled with a highway alignment there. So I'm assuming that this was part of some uh, environmental assessment, for instance, for either a change in the road alignment or a new highway, something like that. And so the, they were concerned about what the effect of that would be on the mountain goats. And so that's that's what happens. It's it's pretty typical as you move down, you're more likely to run into places where people live and we're more likely to have these kinds of conflicts. And in British Columbia, of course, one of the main conflicts is around forestry, which remains a very important industry in this part of the world. And as I said, uh, in these old deep forests that occur on coastal British Columbia, they serve to intercept a lot of snow. So this was in a, an area that I was surveying some goat habitat during a snowfall and just looking up, you can see how much of the sky is actually covered with, uh, with, with forest canopy and that tends to capture a lot of snow, reducing the snow depths under the canopy, giving the goats the ability to move a lot more easily and also to be able to find some food. And we've known this for a long time. So in British Columbia, we've been establishing these specific areas. And that's what I've, I just draped them here on a Google image on the left where you can see these, these red outlines. And what we're trying to do is, is identify these areas that mountain goats are using. And some of them come right down to the, the salt water and some of them um, are a little bit higher, but because they can move up and down depending on what the, what the, uh, what the snow conditions are like. And in these areas, uh, it's logging is, is prohibited. Road building is prohibited. They're not parks, but they're, they're areas that are protected from industrial development. And so you can see there's, this is what the logging looks like on a Google image. You can see this lighter area here. And there is some, some logging above the line. I suspect that that is probably some area. I, su I suspect that this area was established after that logging occurred. So from now on, they won't be able to go above that line. And so these were established by some of my colleagues, but back in the 1990s, uh, via aerial reconnaissance, they would put two biologists in a, in a helicopter and they would fly up and down these, these, these inlets. These are basically fjords along coastal British Columbia. And they would look out the window and they would say, that looks like goat habitat to me. Um, let's, let's put a line around it. And so that's, that's basically how many of these were um, delineated and established since uh, in, in the 1990s. But since then, um, actually dating back to the late 1980s, they've been flying these areas and, and, and surveying the goats and basically putting on, you know, marking on maps every place they, they see a goat. So they've been confirming the occupancy of some of these areas outlined in red over the years, but there's hundreds of them. You can see there's lots. This is just a very, very small part of the coast, obviously, but there's hundreds of these, these blocks of habitat. So we have confirmed occupancy in some, unconfirmed occupancy and others. Some of them don't seem to be doing anything, but we have this 30 year database. And it's very expensive to do this. It costs hundreds of dollars an hour to run a helicopter. Um, and and then we're talking about some very large areas and helicopters don't, very, don't fly for very long before you have to refuel. And so you have to have a remote fuel caches. It's a very big deal to try to uh, survey these areas because this, this is very remote country. Um, so the question really after doing this for 30 years, flying all these areas, we were interested in knowing based on our survey observations, what does the evidence of all these flights tell us about how mountain goats are using these winter habitats? How much did we get right about what if it, all the things that we thought they were doing? Is that what they're actually doing? And how effective are these areas that we've set aside for protection? And do we need to add some more or do we need to delete some others. So on the left here, you can see each one of, this is the, the GPS tracks from the helicopters. Every color is a different year in this one small area. Again, this is an inlet, to kind of a fjord, and you can see the lower elevations that are all covered in deep forest and then, and then rising up to alpine areas. 
And every one of the, the red dots on this image is a mountain goat that they have, that we've tracked over the years, uh, found and, and basically dropped a pin and said, yes, there's a mountain goat using that area. So our approach was to develop a winter habitat suitability model um, to determine, to, to, to see if we could predict the occupancy of the different habitats on the coast by, by mountain goats and see how that lines up with these, these habitat protections we have. So that was the, that was the purpose. So um, what we know about mountain goats is that they have some specific key drivers. So the first one is slope. So slope is just the angle of the, of the, uh, of the, of the side of the mountain. So th this is me, I'm sitting out here in a, another snowstorm. Everybody thinks that um, doing field work is uh, very exotic, but there are some bad days when you have to just basically hunker down in your rain gear and get hypothermia in these kinds of environments and go scrambling up hillsides because mountain goats live in some, as you saw, some pretty inhospitable places. So uh, a 100% slope is about 45 degrees, which is pretty close to what I'm on there. I'm a little shallower than that, probably. And once you get steeper than that, it's really hard to do anything except if you're scrambling around on all fours. So that's an important piece. Elevation is an, obviously, as I said, there, there's this trade-off. They want to stay up high because they want to be safe, uh, but sometimes they can't because of snowpack. So we have this snowpack elevation thing going on forest cover because of the way it's intercepting that snow and also these non-vegetated areas like those rocks that the that the goats were scrambling around on that gives them a lot of safety because they can they can maintain good vigilance they can see around them so all of these are our drivers so now you can see we're starting to form the basis for developing a habitat suitability model we have our habitat drivers we have we have um measures of how the animals are using the habitat. Now, one of the things that we don't have is some, something to compare that use to. So if we think of the, the, our observations, the places that we know the, the goats are using, if we think of that as our target variable, and we have these observations, but we, have, but we need some sort of contrast to learn the model from. And so what we do is we use a, a, a two-state target variable um, with observations, but also putting random locations all over the landscape. So basically what we're doing is we're, we're, we're learning a model to determine the, the, the difference between those observations and the random observations, the, the actual goat observations and then random points on the land base. And, um, and as I said, there's, it's, uh, this is not an unusual technique that we use, but usually um, these, these, the, the standard approach for analyzing this kind of um, this kind of problem would be a generalized linear model using a logistic regression, where our binary um, our binary output variable, our y, would be um, the ones would be use and the zeros would be random, for instance. Uh, but I actually think that this is a really good application for. Uh, a non-parametric approach using Bayesian networks, if, if for no other reason that's the way I roll, but I think there are some, some, some basic advantages to doing this over generalized linear model. The first being, of course, that we are dealing with nonlinear dis distributions. So um, there's, there are reasons why, so right off the top, we should be looking at some sort of um, non-parametric approaches rather than trying to deal with those nonlinearities within the, within the constraints of a linear model. We also have correlated drivers. So uh, I talked about elevation and snowpack, for instance. So yes, as you go higher, you are more likely to run into more snow. So there is a correlation there, but it's not consistent. So on the left-hand side, I'm showing my study area and that's a vast study area the, the, from along the kind of long axis from the US border up to basically the, 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 the panhandle, the south end of the Alaska panhandle. It doesn't quite go up that high, but it's getting close. It's about 650 kilometers. And as we move at its widest point from the salt water into the Fraser Canyon is about 250 kilometers. So it's a very large study area. But as I was explaining with this, with this orographic rainfall, as those, as the, as the, as that air moves in from west to east, it's dropping uh, this rainfall. But by the time actually you get into the Fraser Canyon, we're in we're in a complete desert. So we're we're running from in in that span of 250 kilometers. We're we're going from 
a place of of um, of deep um, temperate rainforest that may be receiving oh a meter and a half of rain a year, something like that, maybe more than that, maybe two meters. Um, and then by the time you get into the Fraser Canyon, it's it's basically sagebrush desert. And in fact, this right here is the town of Lytton, which of course last summer made. I think probably worldwide news when we had that famous heat dome, that heat wave. Um, I think it was, well, it, it, it made it to Pekka. Pekka emailed me last summer and asked me if I was managing to stay cool. Pekka in Finland, he's on here. Hi, Pekka. Um, but um, the town of Lytton recorded Canada's highest temperature ever at 49.6 degrees, which is stunningly hot. And the, the day after that temperature was, was recorded, that town burned to the ground. There was a, there was a spark from a, 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 rail, a railway um, train and it, uh, and it burned the town to the ground. So terrible tragedy there, but <clears throat> gives you the kind of a sense for the kind of ecological variation. So as we move inland from these places where we have these very heavy snow loads, it gets progressively to lighter snow loads as we go east. And that means the, the goats can then spend more time at these higher elevations. So there is a snowpack elevation correlation, but at the same time, um, it's not a perfect correlation. And I wanted to be able to capture that, that variability. Um, and the other thing that kind of bothers me, and I don't know if it's, a, if it's a really big issue or not, but when I think of a logistic regression and we have these binary variables, um, it, it, you know, we want to have ones and zeros. So basically the best, uh, the best uh, design I think would be as if we had places that were used by mountain goats and places that we know were not used by mountain goats, but we don't have information on what was not used by mountain goats. We just have, we just know where they were. We don't know where they, we don't know in those other places if they're there, but we just didn't see them. So we end up using these random locations, but you end up, you always end up polluting some of those, some of those random locations will actually be places that are suitable for mountain goats and which they may be using. So that doesn't, that's not captured very well. I don't think in a logistic regression, but we can certainly, it's a lot easier to deal with that. Or I guess it's a lot more transparent when we do that in the Bayesian framework. So from the perspective of a, uh, from the Bayesian modeling point of view, this is a fairly straightforward model, um, just a, um, a tree augmented naive Bayes learn, where I learned the structure and the, and the parameters from the data, from my, my, um, this, this use variable with observed and random um, locations where the observed locations are my, are my target state. And you can see I've, I've colored these up with um, Pearson correlation coefficients. But I mean, that's another thing too. Um, some, sometimes this stuff is a bit of a hard sell to the people I'm working with because they, they're biologists, they mostly have master's degrees, so they have some upper level, upper level training in um, statistics, usually frequent statistics, um, and they'll always be telling me, why don't you just do a logistic regression? And I explain to them all those issues, and they say, yeah, but everybody does it, and it's kind of good enough. So anything that I can do to kind of put this in a way that is more understandable to them Pearson correlation coefficients, they understand mutual information. I don't want to get into explaining that to them. So this, this they can understand, but you can see how predictably that we do have some high correlations amongst some of those predictors. So snowpack elevation for a stage class, obviously if you go up really high, you actually get very little forest cover at all. Um, and, and still on the coast, most of it, it seems to be in this is either old forest or in this, in, in this null category. And then whether it's rocky or not, of course, is strongly related to what's there in the forest age. So that's kind of the way it, uh, it plays out. And so if we just look at some of the diagnostics for this model, um, you can really see just looking at the total effects on target. This is just the hard evidence here. Obviously you can see where we get some of these nonlinearities. So with the slope, we get a very strong kind of linear response. So the, 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 the Y axis here 0.5, this is the probability of, I call it the probability of selection, but basically it's the probability that one of those points is a, an observed location rather than a random location. So I interpret that as being anything above 0.5, those animals are basically selecting those types of areas. So from shallow to moderate to steep slopes, the animals like them 
the, the goats like them better. But that's different for, say, snowpack, where they avoid these very low snowpacks, which are probably very close to the coast. They like the moderate, they like the deep, but they really do not like that very deep so that it, it falls off again. And that also follows in the elevation. They kind of avoid those lower elevations. They're pick, selecting these mid elevations, but that falls off again. And then you get this M shape with the forest age class. And what happens there is, is down here is, is basically clear cuts. They're avoiding clear cuts like the plague, but then they're selecting these kind of young forests. And it took me a while. That didn't make a lot of sense to me when I realized that a lot of these areas are, are avalanche paths. So these are places that are maintained in kind of a young forest state because maybe every year or every couple of years, you'll have an app, you get an avalanche shoot and the snow comes down and wipes out a bunch of vegetation that starts growing again. And those turn out to be very good places to find forage. But then as the forest in other areas where the forest starts to close in and there's not much to eat underneath, they avoid that, but then they really like the very old forest with the big spreading canopies and there's lots of stuff to eat underneath. They like that kind of stuff. And then they end up avoiding the places that are classified as null. So that's one of the, I think that's one of the real benefits of taking this approach. And it's, I can't even imagine how I would make sense of this in a, in a strictly, uh, in, in the framework of a, of a, of a, you know, a, a linear regression, for instance. Um, then I like to do the uh, sensitivity analysis. These are the direct effects here. So it really shows how those top three variables, slope, snowpack, and forest age class are the real drivers of what these animals are doing. And then just some classification, uh, some confusion matrices to see what kind of fit we're getting. And, it, and it's pretty reasonable given the vast area that I'm working on and um, relatively, I mean, it's not a huge um, data set, but it's not bad. Now, the other thing that I like to do, and this is, <clears throat> I, I, we, don't, we don't see a lot of this in, in, this, the, in the talks, but now we have this model and it's doing a fairly good job of explaining what's going on. How do we apply it? And so this is where, what I wanna do is I wanna map this model. So what does it look like across the landscape? So I have these GIS coverages. This is a very small uh, picture of the slope category. So in this area, you can see there's three classes, black, gray, and kind of whitish there. And those are corresponding to my three slope, slope categories. Each pixel is 25 meters. So I have that mapped out across the entire land base. And I have that for each of my five habitat drivers. Big area. So it's about 112 million records that I'm running through that. So I can just put together an evidence scenario file and, um, and run that evidence scenario file through this model and it will generate for me the, uh, you know, the, the, the probability of this, this the, 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 um, the output probabilities for use and for random and an expected value. So the one that I'm really interested in is this, this kind of probability of use. So this first one is not very good mountain goat habitat, but that varies. And then I can re-import that into my GIS and then I can map that out. Um, and so it, it gives me this really excellent visual representation of what the suitability of mountain goat habitat is over this vast area. So I'm, I'm missing some data. These are the, these red outlines are the, the, the management units within which we, we manage mountain goats and they range in size from 30,000 hectares up to almost a million hectares. And so I am missing some data in the east and in, in some cases um, and in the far north. But you can see the darker the, the darker this is coloring up, the, um, the, more, the more suitable it is for, that's our predictability that's more suitable for mountain goats. So it's a really nice visual representation. Um, and so the clients were super happy with this. And I've actually, I just received the, the, the contract to sign to, to fix this up and, and get into these some, some of these areas and, and do a, another iteration of this, of this model. So I'll be cranking up my Bay Lab license once again, certainly this year to do that work. And we're also looking at doing a summer model as well. Um, so yeah, super, super happy, gives a very nice representation. Um, and this is obviously at a broad scale, but it is kind of amazing to think that we've flown over the past 30 years and just looking at the helicopter and saying, yes, there's a mountain goat there, there's a mountain goat there, there's a mountain goat there. And from that information, we can infer this, that the suitability for this vast landscape 
uh, for this species. And so when the rubber really hits the road is when we start to really get into, if we zoom into one small area here, and so this, instead of blue, this is in green, but basically the darker the green is, the, the, the model is telling me is more suitable for mountain goats. The black outlines are these areas that have always already been protected for, for, um, for mountain goat suitability. And then all the red dots are where mountain goats have been observed over the years. And so you can see that things line up pretty well. First of all, there's a lot of red dots inside the areas that have been protected, which is good, but there's also lots of areas where we have dots that are completely outside those areas that have been protected. But helpfully, most of them are showing up in places that are dark green, which gives us some indication that gives us a good visual expression of how well um, that model seems to be working. So now the, the, uh, the biologists can take this and say, okay, where, where would be some key areas where we want to increase our habitat protection where we have some goats? So it, it could be in places like this, the, 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 say the west side of this drainage, they, they did protect the east side, but they completely missed the west side. So maybe that's a good, a good spot there. And even in places where they don't have a lot of evidence of use, but it looks like it's good habitat, maybe we just haven't seen goats there yet. So say up here, you can see this dark green suggesting this is excellent winter habitat for mountain goats, but we haven't yet seen any animals in there. There's the opportunity to actually protect, up, protect some of that habitat proactively. And maybe at some point down the line, we'll actually find some mountain goats in there. So this is um, a hugely, like I said, I don't, I don't see a lot of people we don't talk a lot about evidence scenario file, files and some of their application, but this is a, it's a pretty powerful way of taking the model and, and using it in a way, in a visual way to color up the landscape to, to help in some of our management decisions. Okay, so that's just about as far as I wanted to go today. Um, just a couple of pictures of me in younger years taking some data out in the field spending a lot of time in helicopters. The older you get, the more uncomfortable you get in helicopters. <clears throat> and then some, some coastal mountain goats hiding in little caves, uh, which they use quite a bit. This was taken by uh, a colleague of mine on a mountain goat survey. So uh, thanks very much. And I'm happy to answer any questions.